respiratory emergencies. So a little bit first about our respiratory system. This is a system that is very important uh, because oxygen, getting it into our body and circulating it around is the basics of life. Has to be done. And everything that we do as EMTs in emergency medicine is to help that process take place. For some reason, some dysfunction may have occurred and we're there to help it. So know the anatomy and physiology. The diaphragm is a muscular stru structure that separates the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. And the diaphragm is considered a muscle of our respiratory system. During our normal respiratory cycle, the diaphragm and other parts of the body work together to inhale and exhale. To um, exhale is a relaxed process. So when we breathe out, our muscles relax. When we breathe in, our muscles contract. So when our muscles are contracting, they're working. When they're relaxing, they're at rest. So uh, the diaphragm is a muscle of respiration. So when it contracts, it moves downward. And when that happens, the muscles between our ribs also contract and they kind of move outward and upward with our lungs attached to the inner lining of our rib cage that creates a space and that space is filled by air going into it. So the inspiratory process is an active process. Our muscles are contracting. That increases the size of our chest cavity and the muscles that are, are the ones that are working are called intercostal muscles. Those are the muscles in between our ribs. And the diaphragm also contracts. The diaphragm, when it contracts, lowers. And then the ribs, um, they move upward and outward when the intercostal muscles contract. And then air is pulled into the lungs. When we breathe out, expiration that's called a passive process because that's when everything is relaxing so the rib muscles and the diaphragm relax the size of the chest cavity decreases and then air flows out of the lungs so when we look at somebody when we go and we assess their breathing we want to know if it's adequate or inadequate adequate breathing is when breathing is sufficient enough to support life. And you can tell that it's sufficient enough because their skin is nice and pink and has good color. They're mentally alert and there's not a whole lot of work to their breathing. So the signs that you'll see is no obvious distress They'll be able to speak in full sentences without having to catch their breath. They'll have normal color, mental status, and orientation also. Adequate breathing can be determined by observing the rate, the rhythm, and the quality. So first of all, the rate. For a normal adult, they breathe about 12 to 20 times a minute. For a child, they'll breathe about 15 to 30 times a minute. And for infants, infants is consider anybody less than a year old, they breathe about 25 to 50 breaths per minute. For the rhythm, it's usually regular, nice and easy. And the quality, the breath sounds normally are present and equal. So inadequate breathing looks like their breathing rate is really high or really low. So for a normal adult that breathes 12 to 20 times a minute, if it's not in the normal range, anything less than 10 or anything above 20, 
to th and even 30, people breathe more than 30 times a minute sometimes, then that is abnormal. Um, once it gets over 30 though, it's probably not adequate enough to support life. Then you also can look at the, the rhythm. Is it irregular? Are the lung sounds, are they there or very shallow and hard to hear? Or is there poor tidal volume? When we talk about tidal volume, it's how much air causes our chest to rise in one breath. So the amount of air we breathe in in one breath, generally in an adult, an average adult, that's about 500 milliliters. But you know that it's adequate when you have fairly good chest rise. For a pediatric patient, the structure of an infant and child's airway differs from that of an adult. They, they're smaller. That means they can be obstructed more easily. In the infant, their tongues are proportionately larger than the rest of the structures in their mouth. Their trachea, their windpipe, is smaller, softer, and even more flexible. Uh, their rib cage is less developed and softer and more flexible also. And they also have their cricoid cartilage. That's the first ring in the uh, trachea is less rigid and it's less developed. So it's a much smaller airway, but much more flexible also. And they also have a heavy dependence on their diaphragm for breathing. If you ever look at an infant as they breathe, they use their stomach muscles a lot. So the pediatric note here is signs of inadequate breathing in infants and children. Some extra things you'll see that you may not recognize or associate with breathe, breathing problems, but it definitely is, is their nasals flare, their nostrils flare open and their their nostrils are kind of like they're trying to suck in. Infants are obligate nose breathers, so their nose has to be pretty unobstructed to get oxygen in and to breathe adequately. Grunting, as they're breathing, you they kind of grunt, you hear a little noise, and that's not normal. Most normal, most breathing that's normal is quiet. Seesaw breathing is another thing that you might see in an infant where their diaphragm and their chest move opposite each other.
Emphysema and chronic bronchitis are chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, disorders mainly of middle-aged or older patients, in which tissues react to smoking, other pollutants, or repeated infections. In chronic bronchitis, the bronchial lining is inflamed, excess mucus forms, and cells are unable to clear away accumulations because the cilia are damaged. In emphysema, the walls of the alveoli break down, reducing the surface area. The lungs lose elasticity, and stale air laden with carbon dioxide is trapped in the lungs. A spontaneous pneumothorax often occurs as the result of the rupture of a subpleural pulmonary bleb. A bleb is an area of weakened lung tissue most often located in the apices of the lung that fills with air. As a bleb distends, its wall weakens and wall tension increases. Like an expanding balloon, the bleb will eventually rupture, creating a pneumothorax. Air then travels down the pressure gradient and enters the pleural space, and the lung collapses. The resultant ventilation perfusion mismatch and decreased tidal volume then lead to dyspnea and hypoxia. Administration of life-saving medications in the pre-hospital setting may be one of the most important things an EMT will do for their patient. It requires the ability to recognize life-threatening conditions, such as hypoglycemia or an asthma attack, knowledge of which medications are used to treat these conditions, and how those medications are administered. Some medications can be administered by the EMT, such as aspirin for chest pain and oral glucose for hypoglycemia, 
while other medications such as nitroglycerin for chest pain, bronchodilators for difficulty breathing, and epinephrine for allergic reactions must already be prescribed to the patient and the EMT will only be assisting the patient with his or her own medications. A metered dose inhaler, or MDI, administers a prescribed dose of medication, usually to a patient with a history of chronic pulmonary disease, such as asthma or COPD, every time the inhaler is activated. The most common medications administered by this route are bronchodilators, which are drugs that dilate or relax the smaller air passages, making it easier to breathe. Because patients are becoming hypoxic during an acute respiratory emergency, they often will be agitated and unable to follow directions well. Therefore, you may be requested to coach or assist the patient in administration of their metered dose inhaler. Most bronchodilators begin to work immediately and their effect can last for hours. The device through which these drugs are administered consists of a metal canister and a plastic container with an attached mouthpiece. The metal canister holds the medication and fits inside the plastic container. When depressed, the device delivers a metered, or an exactly measured dose, of medication. The patient must coordinate their inhalation with activation of the device so that the drug will deposit itself into the bronchioles. Because the coordination can be difficult at times, some metered dose inhalers come with a chamber, or spacer, that attaches itself to the plastic container. The chamber holds the medication until the patient inhales it. Once you have determined that the patient is in respiratory distress, as evidenced by shortness of breath, tachypnea, tachycardia, cyanosis, moist skins, accessory muscle use, presence of wheezing or silent lung sounds, and or is tripoding and has their prescribed MDI with them, follow these steps. Take BSI precautions. Explain the procedure to the patient and get his or her consent for an assist if needed. Keep in mind the five rights involved in administration of any medication. Ensure that you have the right patient, which is one in respiratory distress, the right drug, which is a bronchodilator, the right dose, which will be metered, the right route of administration, which will be inhaled, and right time, which is now, while the patient still has their own respiratory drive and can follow directions. Shake the canister vigorously for a few seconds. If the patient is wearing an oxygen mask, remove the mask. Instruct the patient to hold the inhaler upright in his or her mouth with the thumb on the bottom of the canister and the index finger on top. If the patient cannot do so, then you should hold the inhaler. Tell the patient to take a deep breath and to exhale fully. Have the patient quickly place his or her lips around the mouthpiece, making a tight seal. Direct the patient to take a deep breath slowly over a five-second period. Simultaneously, either you or the patient should depress the canister. Make sure the patient has started inhalation before the canister is depressed. Remove the inhaler and request that the patient hold his or her breath for 10 seconds or as long as possible. Coach the patient to exhale slowly with pursed lips. Replace the oxygen mask. The medications in MDIs usually cause an increase in heart rate as well as a feeling of nervousness or shakiness. You may also hear more wheezing now that air is able to move through the bronchioles. Reassure your patient, but also be sure to document your findings.